All right, uh, so welcome to this uh, final session of a long and uh, pretty hot uh, marathon, today marathon. So uh, scenario for this final se uh, session is that uh, we was meant to last for one hour, one hour and, uh, and a half or one hour and a quarter or something like that, but we'll, we'll make it shorter, so it will be <laughs> no one protests, uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, so that uh, shortly after uh, 6.30, which was the initial date, not so much after 6.30, we'll stop. So there will be, in fact, uh, two questions uh, uh, around which uh, this uh, conversation should uh, gravitate. So there is uh, the first question, which... Uh, I'll ask in particular to uh, the uh, three keynote uh, speakers, uh, and then the, I'll, we'll open up then for, for the second question. Uh, and, but when I open up, and related to the discussion we had at the end of the first day, um, you'll have noticed uh, that, uh, again, the panel is exclusively male uh, this evening, so there will be a strict priority to any uh, uh, female participant uh, in uh, the uh, sort of the open discussion. If any of the few female participants want to have priority, want to say something, then have absolute priority at that stage. It's a pure excuse to uh, turn to that picture and see that behind uh, Paul Henri Spack and uh, Snois, you have just men, uh, all men, moreover, dressed in exactly the same way. It's better on that side where the, pres the older presidents of uh, the institute are all male in the first row, but it's getting better in the second row. So uh, even the, the most recent uh, one, the one, the last one elected is not yet there. So there is a uh, four to two, I think, uh, should be in the second row, right? And so it's uh, four women to two men, if you add the current one. So it's uh, getting better there, but it's better there than it has been in our panels. So um, we'll so a small compensation priority to the ladies in the discussion. So first question uh, is uh, this, which was announced in uh, in in uh, in the program. Uh, well, we have these uh, three guys who are uh, each defending or presupposing to some extent uh, um, a theory of justice. And the question is simply, well, what follows from uh, the theory of justice to which you are committed or which you are assuming uh, as regards uh, private property? Somewhat more narrowly, the private property of um, external objects. Uh, to make this somewhat more specific, uh, according to your own conception of justice, is it conceivable to have uh, a just society without private property? So if it's not conceivable, so if private property is intrinsic to a just society, how unrestricted should this private property be, according to your conception of justice? If it is conceivable to have a just society uh, without private property, well, what would be, then be the alternative to this private property? Uh, public property, uh, communal property, something else. And uh, under what conditions uh, would, could one do away with private property? Uh, so, in brief, uh, what is your conception of justice and what follows from, for the private property of external objects? We can leave self-ownership aside, except if self-ownership is part of what's needed in order to indicate what the implications are. Huh? Okay, so that means factor out. It's a preliminary question. Very briefly, what is your conception of justice and what, uh, how does it relate to private property? So is there one to volunteer to start first, or otherwise we'll do the alphabetical order? No, okay. Uh, uh, no, 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 you um, were volunteering. Hillard, perhaps? Yeah. Hillard starts. That's, uh, I think, your answer is... So, uh, the answer to uh, what I think was the first question there was, uh, is that, uh, no, I don't think you can have a theory of justice which doesn't uh, rest on the idea of private property. Um, obviously, person's private property in themselves is the starting point, but I think far beyond that, it requires... Individual. I don't think you can have a theory of justice that isn't talking about rights, and I don't think you can have rights that aren't basically private property rights. That's the, the order of argument. 
But I don't think that um, that view, I, th I take that to be a purely formal conceptual point, which uh, could be true of any theory of distributive justice. I mean, I, I subscribe to a particular theory, but I don't think that theory is entailed by this need for private property rights. Um, it's as, uh, as compatible with Rawls or other, other views. Um, and then on, I think, what was your final point? Um, could we have, to ask, could we have society without private property rights? Yes, I think, but it, it would have to be a society where everybody's practical desires, what they wanted to do, were just spontaneously harmonious with those of everyone else. Okay, so the society is not only conceived, but it could be a just society on your view, providing there is this convergence. Yeah, I mean, what would be happening is that uh, whenever it appeared that two people's activities or two groups' plans' activities were incompatible in the ways that I described yesterday, <coughs> um, they would negotiate, uh, discuss, and uh, they would come to some consensus as to which of these activities was the better one, and the people who were wanting to pursue the uh, worse one would just back off and... Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. well Jean-Fabien. I, I, I'm sure that to the question, uh, can there be a just society without private property, the answer is no. And uh, the reason for this, in my view, would be this, is that um, if you don't have any private pro property, <laughs> you don't have any means to... Uh, constrain people to adopt behavior they don't want to, to adopt. And if you don't have the means to constrain people or to coerce them into behavior they don't want to adopt, you can't have a productive society. You can't multiply consumption goods. So you, you, you have to have this means of exerting some pressure on others, coercing them into behaviors that they wouldn't uh, adopt if they had uh, the choice not to, so uh, if you want to have a just society, you uh, have to have a sort of a prosperous society, something to share. And if you want to have a prosperous society, you have to have a mean to coerce people into being productive. And private property is uh, non-dispensable for that precise reason. Okay. So which is fundamentally different <coughs> for, from Hillel's, right? Because... Uh, he has said it is just a, a sheer conceptual point, irrespective of any consequentialist uh, considerations, whereas no. in your view, it's you say it's, it's essential for... View, right? Yeah, in, on your view, there can't be a just society that uh, wastes its resources uh, massively, so you, it needs to be a prosperous society, and you can't have a prosperous society without protecting exactly. people's property. Which, and which doesn't mean that the right of property has to be unconditional. Has no, and, and we, <laughs> we, we can re we return can to that then on, on the... Uh, yeah, I believe that... Uh, you, you can speak less loudly. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, there can be one that, that uh, there can be a, a society that is just, that has no private property. The, uh, I think a, a society, there's one only one form of property that there must be at least some of, and that's a commons. We cannot interact freely with other people in a society of more than four people without some, without some common property. Uh, so we have to have a commons. Now, it could, if everybody wants to live on a commons, then it would be just if we all have a commons. Uh, that's uh, and if, if the, to the extent that there are people in the world today who, and there are at least some people in the world today who prefer to live on a commons uh, they should be allowed to have their own society that is entirely filled with common property now I don't think that's going to be all of us but I think those people should be able to live as they can and we should try to make ways to accommodate them as we've done with cert, as we're sort of doing with uh, a few of the remaining uh, a few of the remaining isolated indigenous communities that are left now uh, why property the question of why property under my conception of justice is if people want it if there is if why there's a mutually why private property yeah. well why private or public property 
<laughs> if you want to take the commons and make it into pro- uh, another mix of some some mix of public and private property as well as a commons, I uh, I think that's fine as long as there's a mutually beneficial deal in which the majority the majority signs on to the deal and you do it in such a way as to minimize the interference, the negative interference, and maximize the benefit that those who can't sign on to that deal for whatever reason, uh, for whatever reason, uh, that you minimize the negative interference with them because it's impossible to have a unanimous agreement or should usually be expected to be impossible. So you minimize the interference with them, and then you can have whatever mix of public and private property people are most going to want. The indications seem to be that that would be a substantial mix of both. There'd be a, quite a bit of public property and a quite a bit of uh, private property, which would be subject to regulations and taxation in order to make the deal palatable for those who have less. The distinction you make, so on your, in your terminology, between commons and public property is? A commons is, is property that anyone can use on an equal basis as long as they, they don't take anything, they, they don't establish ownership in, in any part of it any longer than it is that uh, they're actually directly using it. So, um, so li- literally period. anyone. Uh, well, you have a closed commons and an open commons. Closed commons, you have to be a member of the society, right. and open commons is a member... Uh, you you do not have to be a member of the society. Anyone can use it. Uh, the Inuit famously thought of the Arctic as an open commons. They didn't think they had any special claim to it, and right. some other groups did. Now, if you wanted to have some people on a commons and other people in a private property system, that commons would probably have to be a closed commons. Right. Uh, at least you'd have to have some criteria for membership or something. Now, public property is... Public property, there's, there is... A, there's uh, some overlap because the roads and the sidewalks are essentially provided to be a commons where people can use them to interact with other people, but they're managed. In, they're a managed commons. The government takes full possession of them and decides, will this be a one-way street? Are there going to be crossing guards on this thing? So they're managed publicly. Publicly, public property, when you think of something that's public property but not a commons, is something like a school or a government-owned dam or the Houses of Parliament. The Houses of Parliament are publicly owned, but they're not a commons. Not a, I can't just go into the House of Parliament and grab what I want and, you know, and, and, and use it for as long as I want, as long as I leave it when I'm done. Um, so those things are public property, and I think the distinction between those and commons are very different because people need a commons to have interaction with other people. They also might well need a need uh, some public property in order to have good schools and, and infrastructure and, uh, and some place for their, their, their legislature to meet. Then about the, then the relationship between you three answers. So at first sight, there is a, 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 you answer yes mm-hmm. to the question to which uh, the other two replied no, but I'm not sure there is really a contradiction between your position. I'm not trying to reconcile you at yeah. all prices. Uh, at all price. so, but uh, it's, it seems to me that what you say, yes, uh, it is possible to have a just society providing the people uh, agree to have uh, yeah. to, to just have something that is called the commons and so they take what, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, they use it in a way that's respectful of the other and so on. And uh, uh, so, uh, relative to uh, Jean Fabien's position, you say, yes, uh, you may consider this uh, conceivable, but de facto, in order for this sort of society to prosper enough, you'll have to uh, start introducing well, private property. Who's going to produce the pie? Yeah. <laughs> yes. The common. Who's going to produce it? Uh, how? Uh, well, Mother Nature produced a common before <laughs> any of us got here, and uh, it's really time that property owners stop taking credit for producing that. that. And as a matter of fact, um, this, is, this is something that, that there's a group of people who want to live on a commons, 
uh, have been regularly forced for the last 10,000 years to get off the commons so they it can be split up for either public or private property. And very often it's, it's not that they say, oh, that private property system looks great, I can't wait to get into it. They are, have to be forced into it. And it's, it's going on still today as the commons are being closed. And they're uh, one of the few places, you know, we, we, they're, uh, of course, a big history of the colonial period in the United States when the Native Americans were forced off the commons a- after um, those, those that practiced, treated the land as a commons, and those who weren't were also forced off also. But that's so Jean, Jean Fabien, uh, yeah. Maybe it would be very easy to answer that yeah. uh, if people have to be coerced out of the commons and, and, and if they refuse mm-hmm. private appropriations, mm-hmm. it's because they didn't sense the advantages of it. But afterwards, when they begin to sense the advantages of private property, well, they say, well, I've been expelled, but uh, maybe it's not so bad after all, because, uh, I mean, the effects of, uh, of property in terms of, of, of progress and prosperity are huge. Well, that's so, what... And everyone, well, and everyone is going to take advantage of The potential is huge. The potential is huge. And the reality is huge. Well, for, no, for the wealthy among us. But uh, I just published a book in January that looks at that claim that we've all benefited from uh, closing the commons, and it's just simply not true. The poorest no, people in our sci- societies today, if, if, if they had the opportunity to trade with somebody living in a non-state society on a commons, would have, would have a better opportunity for welfare. But would for they have so. been born... What's that? that? Is, uh, would that have been born? Because, uh, of course, part well, of the claims would be there has been such a massive uh, demographic expansion uh, thanks to uh, the development yeah. of agriculture, the development of uh, uh, industry, which, uh, uh, I mean, uh, allegedly or, uh, yeah. and would not have happened. So, so you are endorsing the repugnant hypothesis uh, that it is better which to have a larger... A larger, oh, sorry, the repugnant conclusion that that it's better to have a larger population with lower welfare um, no. than it is to have a smaller population with higher welfare, and it's also, I think, in a worse no. way because this, because this because, uh, because the uh, well, that, well, that's the justifications. They would not have been born. We can treat you worse than you could do for yourself living in a non-state society on a commons because there's seven billion of us, and you wouldn't be able to. Res- uh, support seven yeah. billion of us. I think that's that's a really poor excuse, but also not the fact that not everyone is worse off. Some of us are far better off, and so some of us are worse off. So I think it's a really poor excuse for those who are better off not to share the benefits of people and make them actually want to leave the commons, rather than say, "Well, you are uh, you would have been born otherwise, so we can keep we can share all the benefits amongst ourselves." Okay. Uh, and you can uh, uh, after this failed attempt yeah. to reconcile you with yeah. Jean Fabien, <laughs> let, let, let me try to reconcile you with uh, mm-hmm. with Hillel. Uh, so, because his point was that. Uh, and you could you could have uh, you yeah. you allow for the in principle to the imaginary possibility of having a just society without <coughs> private property, but under the the unrealistic assumption that there was such a convergence between people that that would agree on sharing the common and commons and and the way in which it on the way well, I, it was I, think, specific. I think this is what um, Marx envisaged with the withering of the state uh, the withering of the state just um, I don't know. What would be left would be an organization that just made purely technical decisions, sort of coordinate, solve coordination problems and things of that sort, um, and, but wouldn't be making substantive um, value-bearing decisions, choices, because there would be this harmony of interests, and there would be harmony of interests, Marx thought. Yeah. Um, because everybody's basic needs would be satisfied. And he takes inadequate account of the fact that people want more than their basic needs. Yeah. But um, so that's related to the point that was made in one of the papers, quoting Waldron on uh, private property being a way of solving the problem of scarcity. Right? Yeah. If you are in a situation of abundance, then uh, you no longer have need this <coughs> way of uh, protecting. I think that's right. Yeah. And. Okay, and so and th- here the <coughs> disagreement, like in previous case, may be an empirical one about, uh, mm-hmm. and that is about whether yeah. uh, 
uh, I mean, it's conceivable for people to converge sufficiently for them to be able to run the commons. In, uh, and some people who are, have some limited uh, communal initiative, like just running a, a vegetable garden in their mm -hmm. neighborhood, uh, can, uh, they can manage to some extent, and then there may be some conflicts, and the people in conflict, they just leave. Mm -hmm. The vegetable garden is not the whole neighborhood. If the, and so, mm -hmm. But, but you, your point is that there are contexts, cultural contexts, yeah. in which it is possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me then throw in also for um, the, the second question which I, uh, on which, uh, we, we, which we can then relate again to what we've just been discussing and which is related also to the interests of uh, some of the people who presented uh, the papers and the organizers of this conference is the question of how you view about uh, these views about the place of uh, private uh, property over external objects. Uh, how is <coughs> how it is affected, if at all, by the shift to a different sort of economy uh, uh, or a different sort of society, which may be variously described in a way that's not equivalent with each other formulations as the information uh, society, the digital economy, uh, cognitive capitalism, uh, something, uh, something like that. So uh, where there are a number of uh, features, of course, Part of it is really the, the role that is being given uh, without comparison to what, but with some analogies, but without comparison to what we had up to 20 years ago. So the role that is being given to digitalize information and with a number of uh, consequences. There are consequences about the feasibility of protecting private property huh? because uh, it, this, this sort of, compared to material goods, this information is less uh, excludable. And we are coming back to the discussion about the, the, the features of public goods. So it's not less exclude, excludable, and private property is a matter of excluding some other people from interfering. So it's less excludable. It's not, that, uh, it's not completely non excludable, but it's less excludable than material goods. And so the, the nice uh, Van Gogh wall, which we see on uh, the announcement of the conference, I mean, the analogue for information is uh, very hard to, to build. It's not enough to have a few thick stones like in the poem that, uh, <laughs> with which uh, the conference uh, was started. So there is this, but also about the, the legitimacy of, uh, the, of private property may be challenged there because of the, the, the non-rivalry, the other characteristics of the public good being more present for those things. The fact that you have a zero-sum production, a zero-marginal sorry, not zero sum, zero marginal cost production of the goods. So just making one more copy of a book uh, was something you have to print it, pack it, send it, etc. It's costly. Now you just click and, it's, uh, and you have another copy of a book in a computer uh, a long way away. So this uh, raises, I mean, some issues then about the, even the legitimacy of uh, protecting private property in the way we did for material goods. Uh, but, uh, so, but, but another aspect is the big data, which were discussed in Francis Chanval's uh, presentation yesterday, because uh, it's also all this information we just create as users or as consumers is then also, at the same time, it's, uh, it, it, it is provided uh, at no cost to people who uh, produce the, the so-called big, uh, big data. And so, uh, again, and with, a, with a zero cost and, and in a way that uh, and raises questions, not the same one, but the legitimacy of, uh, of exclusion. So the, uh, and, so, and, and there are other aspects of it. And so, however you describe it, cognitive capitalism, uh, the information society, the g digital economy, uh, some aspects of it, like the role of platforms, etc. There is something that has been changed, essentially the, the increasing role of intellectual property versus um, material property. And so, and, uh, and, and so, and the, the question to you, but, uh, but also then to, to the room, anyone who may uh, want uh, to talk is, uh, well, should we really see that as something that must modify deeply the role we give to private uh, property? So the sort of uh, uh, productivist argument, say, in favor of uh, protecting private property may be very strong in the case of material property, but perhaps not so strong in the case of information property. So I've mentioned to all three keynote speakers 
that I was going to ask a question of that sort, and all three of them said, oh, that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> something on which I haven't thought in a systematic way. But you've had some time to do so overnight. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps uh, some of you want to, to kick off by uh, uh, reacting to that question or say something. You're not obliged, but you can. I, I, I must say that uh, you, you should uh, accept me for answering that question because I'm a man who tries to stay at the maximum distance of any electronic device <laughs> <laughs> as far as I can, yeah. which becomes more and more impossible in practical life. But uh, more seriously, there's one point uh, which affects our lives uh, as members of the academic community and uh, have been struck by this very, very seriously in the last years, is that um, as our teachers and members of the university, we produce texts, uh, we publish them in, in journals and reviews, and um, they belong to the uh, publishers who publish those journals and reviews, and afterwards, uh, those publishers sell our own work to our university. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the... the the technical progress uh, would uh, allow us to bypass such a, a rent-seeking <laughs> situation which is not acceptable and just to nullify the profits made uh, by the publishers on our backs yeah. and on the backs of the students and to make our work uh, a, a common, uh, yeah. literally common, free for all because we have been paid for producing those texts and uh, we don't have to pay to have them back. Yeah. Uh, I even experienced a publisher who he published one of my texts, sent me an email saying, if you want to buy a copy of the text, you can. So uh, this, this should not exist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah the, uh, the, it's strange to Come. me that... The, oh, Come, no, no, go ahead. Okay, that the... the, 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 the the big chump in that story is not necessarily us, but the university. Because I, I, I'm well paid for the writing I do, not by the... No, no, not by, yeah. the university spends a lot of yeah. money on that. So the university pays me to do the writing, and, and then time. it pays a second time to the publisher <coughs> to buy the writing yeah. back. Why don't the universities just cut them out? <coughs> I, I, don't, I don't get that. But I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the president of Harvard. That's, that's one of the things we'll do after the revolution at Harvard. Oh, once I look at the endowment. Uh, no, but, the, uh, yeah. no, but the, the point is that university libraries are caught in the system because yeah. they can't mm -hmm. afford not to have the journals in which mm -hmm. you publish your marvelous articles. Yeah. And, so, uh, and so that... Uh, and, and, and you can't... But then there is a distinction between Harvard University Press and Harvard <coughs> University, Cambridge University yeah. Press and Cambridge... University. Yeah. The argument actually is against an oligopoly of universities mm -hmm. rather than, I mean, the, the private body of Sage, uh, Blackwell, yeah. uh, Elsevier, Springer. Springer, yeah, but they don't, make that, they don't make that much money. Uh, yeah, that's uh, not true. Uh, uh, on the journals, they make an awful lot of money. <laughs> yeah. They're very profitable they corporation. They don't make yeah. a lot of money out of social science and philosophy, let alone philosophy yeah. articles, yeah. but they make a lot of yeah, money science, out of the science. Out of medicine. Medicine. Yeah. Yeah. Elsevier is an empire. Yeah. 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 I mean, I was involved in trying to start several journals, and the economy, I, it's not an easy economics of yeah. trying to do, to, to do your own journal. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, Hila, do you want to? Yeah, so I, I think I'm a, I'm a little conflicted about intellectual property rights. Uh, on the whole, I think they're not legitimate. Um, at all. And that seems, mm -hmm. at all. Uh, and that seems to be the view, I think, of most mm -hmm. libertarians, even right libertarians, um, that these, uh, the litmus test, it seems to me, for at least for libertarians, of whether something is a right or can be a right or not, is whether it could be, it, it could exist in the state of nature, so-called, in the absence of a political system, a legal, uh, an enforced legal system. And obviously intellectual property rights couldn't because they are monopolies granted by the state. Um, nobody in a state of nature would have the authority to unilaterally declare a monopoly on something that, that imposes restrictions, uncontracted restrictions, on what other people may do with their legitimate property. It just, uh, 
Yeah. Too bad the first person who invented farming didn't think of copywriting it. You know, we all. But, yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but again, again if, we, if we take this position, uh, isn't there a risk that a few, some people who have uh, invented things because they know that, that their right will be protected, they won't make the effort to invent anything? Yeah, so I mean, I, you have to be protected in order to be, to be intellectually productive. The, there is that and risk, you, and. Um, we, we didn't I expect Jean Fabien to speak like an economist. In yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this is um, uh, one of those occasions where uh, theories of justice have to bite a bullet and, um, and make clear that they're not utilitarian theories. Yeah. Yeah. And, I'm, and it's, it is questionable the extent to which we need copyright protection and patent protection to get people to do stuff, because a lot of people do produce things for open source, and in the days of the folk tradition, uh, there was a lot of good music being produced when somebody could take your song and add stuff, change it, move it around, and people forgot who first did the song. Um, so I'm not sure about that. And I, I don't, I agree with Hillel that I'm, I'm, I don't think that there is necessarily a natural right to intellectual property. And whether there's, whether there's, um, uh, an efficiency gain from it, I don't know either in, in all cases. But I do think one thing about the digital economy that we shouldn't forget is that it's still, uh, it's, it's still based, uh, it's still something that is important foot in resources and controlling, and in, in controlling, the, uh, for lack of a better term, the means of production, is that big companies get large advantages. The small companies that do manage to break in, just become big companies and not a big alternative. It's not realistic that we're all going to start the next Google. It, and so it brings up a really important institutional position of how the individual relates to the institution. And I think any of our theories could be applied just as well in that, in that situation. I think, I think um, to get a kind of transparently clear view of where, where rights lie in relation to the objects of intellectual property rights. We need what, what some philosophers are working on, but not yet very many, which is a, an a, account of the ontology of information. What kind of stuff is information? Uh, so we know roughly what material things are, and we know what completely, we can have ontologies in which there are minds as, as distinct from brains, um, but we don't know what information is. Some electrical engineers have tried to model information and, and it may be possible that that will contribute to the ontological uh, characterization of information. Uh, because we, the reason I think we need to know the ontology of information in order to get a a clear account of whether people can have rights to it and who can have rights to it. If, um, is we want to know whether, as as is always the case with uh, when people patent things or copyright things, we want to know whether somebody has discovered an idea, a piece of information, or actually created. Intellectual property rights are supposed to go to creators and not discoverers. Um, and not to corporations who buy them up. That too. Um, so yeah, until we know the you know what kind of stuff information is, it, is. Is it something that pre-exists and is discovered, exactly. or is something Plato that's said, invested? Plato says it's all there in the cave. Yeah. So all you're doing when you discover, what it, well, all you're doing when you invent a concept is discovering it. It's, it already pre, it pre-existed in the game. You don't get an intellectual property right for a discovery. No, but all the letters of all the books you wrote pre-existed. You just selected some letters among the you discovered. Right. But, uh, okay, so the, but I think in a way, so certainly as you initially formulated it, you have a, a more radical position saying in principle uh, there is no room for intellectual property rights so, it, so that means there is a big change then uh, as more and more of our wealth take the forms of the form of information less yeah. uh, and less of this wealth uh, is legitimately protected by private property and I Where think I think that the the, uh, 
it's an empirical argument as to whether this will have disincentivizing effects. So, and there is some data, I'm, I haven't read much about this from economists, that say actually granting uh, intellectual property rights disincentivizes inventiveness because the people who have these licenses make a small modification in order to stop yeah, others yeah. from competing, yeah, costs of entry, yeah. uh, and so on. So there But your own view is that you don't care about that because it's a matter of principle, whereas the, the debate no, between but, Jean... But, Jean but, then, but then in, in, in this case, uh, I mean, uh, exploration of the ontology about what kind of, of reality is information is, is useless. Yeah. The only question is... Uh, what happens if you confer rights of yeah, property yeah. Yeah. Uh, to some people on some things, and what doesn't happen if you don't? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, consequentialist again in terms the of the incentives. Of, uh, the, the, yeah. the, the ontological exploration yeah, sure. is, is okay. useless. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, that's uh, economists would agree with you <laughs> once again. But uh, <laughs> and so the and but uh, and then there may be because on some points like uh, the thing what you said about scientific. Uh, Publishers, etc. I'm sure Carl would, would agree with you, and then there may be some empirical disagreements about the extent to which uh, patents uh, play a positive mm -hmm. or negative role. Do you really need to, to, in order to generate all the, the huge amount of research and development in the medical sector, for example, medicine? So, do you need to give patents to this big multinational for as long as that enjoyed? Given that there are also many failures in the in their attempts to get the uh, medicines uh, recognized and all that. Okay, let's uh, open the debate as promised, a priority to the female participants, I can say. So, uh, only yes. <laughs> Of the commons. Yeah, I, I, I think yeah, you're right. I think tragedy of the commons is uh, better describes what you're talking about than free riding. Um, although, if you want to talk about free riding, we can talk about that as well. Tra tra tragedy of the commons is is something that that uh, economists have been worrying about for a while, and it is and has been often used as an excuse for why we need private property. And there are at least some cases where that can happen, where that, where that happens. But private property isn't the only solution. Also, government re regulation is a solution to tragedy of the commons. Uh, but in addition, the, uh, uh, that a lot of non-state societies have have uh, customary ways of avoiding the tragedy of the commons. M most hunter-gatherer band societies, which for this, this book on prehistoric myths I've been reading a lot about lately, um, can habitually underutilize their resources. And clearly, they, uh, they had a sustainable, they had a sustainable uh, system because it was going on for hundreds of thousands of years and was still the majority of land on earth was used by people treating it as a commons until the colonial period when settled people started deciding that they wanted the land of people using it as commons. So for 200,000 years, it was sustainable. Uh, so the tragedy of commons can't be that great uh, if, it, if, you know, if you can go 200,000 years and not show any signs of, of being unsustainable. However, there is a possibility that, uh, that at least sometimes this has happened. We know of at least one historical event when uh, the Polynesians 
got to New Zealand and they hunted the moa to death. Now, they didn't make their society unsustainable, but they did, uh, uh, due to the tragedy of the commons, they did e- extinguish one very valuable resource that I'd like to have. Uh, now, uh, now, there are many other megafauna that might have been destroyed in this way, but that's the only one we know for sure was destroyed in this way. So it is something that can is happen. That there, is an alternative, there are alternative, yeah, there are to alternative private, ways to dealing to with private it. Private property. Then. Yeah. And okay. that, I think, was maybe the problem there was not the, the, it was this, was not the lack of a government, because the kind of small-scale governments they might have had might have had the same vulnerability. Okay. Does that satisfy you? If not, yeah, you can say so. Indeed, it's something that is like empirically verified that the majority of the comments does not always happen. But I mean, I'm trying to figure this out myself. Like, what is the difference and why? I mean, does that mean that this, uh, I mean, this unlimited needs of humans are actually not verified? Or does that just mean that there are some specific social structures that prevent... Uh, the tragedy of the commons to happen. So. Oh, in that sense, if it, am I spending yeah. too much time? Yeah, in, yeah, in that no, sense, yeah. briefly. So in that, that sense, happen. the the smaller scale societies have had a, a, a really good system. <laughs> then the small scale nomadic uh, societies, less than a hundred people, they're fully nomadic. Is generally well. First of all, they they can't really accumulate wealth because they have to carry it with them. So they really don't have an incentive to take more than they can use. But in, and also they tend to have a strong, they tend to have a strong uh, uh, ethic of a strong ethic of you should not be shown to have more than someone else, and if you have more than you need and someone else needs some, you should share it. And if you continually don't do this, you shouldn't camp with us. You should go find some libertarians to camp with, um, <laughs> which can be hard. Jean Fabien, yeah. just, just a question for Colin. Yeah. Do you think that this kind of a social organization would be possible on a larger scale when people do not physically know each other? Well, it was done on an extremely large scale uh, up until 10 or 20,000 years ago. It was done on all, all of the inhabited continents. L- large uh, scale, so but in small groups. Large scale in small groups. Small, yeah, yeah. Yes, but but this point so is when, groups, when you um, have large populations interacting in a complex way. There are in anonymous relations. There are anarchists who believe that, and I have not been, I have not been convinced by that. Uh, the only, the only anarchism that, that I, I think, uh, essentially meets the, essentially meets the the uh, a, def, a good definition of anarchism is this very small scale okay. uh, type of life. So, uh, first, is there another female participant who would like to say something? No. If not, then I can, I'll give some sort of priority to the organizers who uh, have been working very hard to make all this exchange possible. So, uh, Maxime. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to, to, to get back to the, your challenge of the, of course, the extension of the realm of uh, intellectual property. Uh, because so, so since I, I worked on IP, uh, I did the thesis on IP, I, I have a few hypotheses that I'd like to test um, and to add to what you said. So I think, so th- th- I, have, I have two worries about the extension of property into the material realm. Um, one is a, is a worry about equality, and, a, and the other is a, need, a worry about uh, freedom. Uh, the worry about equality is that I think there are some characteristics that are maybe more inherently in, in egalitarian with intellectual property, and that is that, so basically enforcement is very costly, as Philippe hinted, especially in the, um, the digital world and uh, with the, uh, the zero marginal cost of reproduction era. Um, and uh, with IP, uh, small IP owners, they don't really care about uh, IP for their use value. What, what's important is the, the exchange value. So the thing is, the first thing small IP owners, uh, creators and so on, inventors, do when they do have IP is to transfer them to, uh, of course, large corporations and for perpetuity under terms, uh, take it or leave it. Um, and so there is a tendency uh, for of concentration, of course, of this IP in the hands of the, these large uh, corporations. And the second worry... Uh, so that, that means so the extension of private property as understood for material goods <coughs> to intellectual property would have 
a more in inegalitarian yeah. impact than in the case of material. S since, since there is a larger scale of the economy, of the G it's, I think it's a third of the GDP that is that relies on, uh, today on uh, IP intensive industry. So, of course, and since IP seems to have this more inegalitarian characteristic, wouldn't IP increase okay. inequalities? And the other worry uh, gets back to what, what Carl said about um, the need to have uh, a commons to interact with people. But he was talking about the material realm, but I think that is totally, yeah. of course, uh, relevant for the immaterial realm, where one of the main uh, challenge is to preserve a public domain uh, where, where people could, uh, a, a an intellectual commons, where people could enter, interact with uh, information um, and, and preserve it against the uh, con constant extension of the, the scope, the subject matter, uh, and the length of protection of, of IP. You, you know that now uh, hyperlinks might be uh, uh, copyright infringement. Uh, IP protects today uh, sports move, choreographies, uh, fragments, perfumes. Uh, at least that is under, still under debate, but soon enough. So, so uh, how can we preserve our freedom, people's freedom to interact with information and to interact with each other against this tendency, this creeping tendency of extending the realm of, uh, of, uh, of IP and not leaving much uh, of, in, of the intellectual commons? Yeah. Okay. Does no, any of you? Um, I don't feel like uh, answering that because okay. I'm not competent. <laughs> okay. But the, it's also the, the, I mean, the first point, uh, well, I mean, if. Uh, oh, I just it, agree with you. I, I, <laughs> I agree, and I think it's, it's really important to stress a lot of the things we're using as commons online are privately owned. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, exactly. And that they're, they're getting that money. Like, uh, it would seem possible to create a cooperative Facebook. And it would also seem that the biggest barrier to that is the inertia. Uh, you've got to get you've got to get people to switch. First, it would be the hardcore. It would be the hardcore. We should own this people, and you have to get a critical mass of them that the other people want to join. And and it would be really hard to get the switch over. But it's uh, but we're also paying Facebook billions of dollars for uh, because it's hard to switch. But it's not sheer inertia, it's network externalities. And so that, yeah, yeah. Uh, you want to have, and they tend to natural monopolies. Yeah. And it's, uh, so that you want to be connected with the others, they are on Facebook, so you stay on Facebook. Yeah, that's, 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 that's you, what Are I'm you on Facebook? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you are. He's not. He's oh, so he, <laughs> there are a few real reasons. Okay, so uh, yes, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So thanks very much. One thing that perhaps uh, was a bit lacking a question uh, to be addressed here at this conference was the, quite, is the question what kind of private property uh, um, should we be instituting, right? So, which kinds of rights, uh, so what kind of rights should our institutions grant to uh, private property holders in virtue of owning private property? Uh, so there's, it's good, I think, that we had a lot of legal theorists here as well, and some of them did, did address this question, but I think it would be good to bounce this question back onto the philosophers. Uh, so there have been a good, uh, so perhaps just to, to kind of clarify the question a bit further, you, you may all, all be familiar with John Christmas' book, right, The Myth of, of Ownership, and he argued that um, different kinds of justificatory strategies are needed to justify the bundle of rights that private property holders have in a liberal society, right? So some of them are control rights, uh, like rights to use, rights to manage, rights to possess, and some are, uh, are income rights, like rights of capital. So I don't think it's very helpful to just say, well, any right is a private property right, because one of the basic questions that I think we need to be addressing is what kind of rights do we grant to private property holders? I was wondering what your theories of justice would say about that. So, uh, give, given the, the limited time, what, uh, and given that there are quite a few people who have something on their heart which they want to express, I propose that we go, go keep your interventions uh, short, and so we'll uh, formulate them, and then I'll ask uh, the three people then to selectively respond, and so you may want to respond in particular to this one. So, you had a question. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, to have a remark to what you say, Jeff, this speaks about uh, the idea that private property is being a necessary incentive. Uh, that that has, has been discussed. If you're reluctant to go on the Marx and uh, Frankfurt School site, let's go uh, trends up on the, uh, in the US with the pragmatic, the pragmatist uh, philosophy. 
And John Dewey said, for example, that the very idea that labor has to be paid because uh, it's, uh, economists would say, its utility is negated, that's something that, it, that is completely contingent on some social organization that makes work so undesirable on the scale of an entire life that you wouldn't do it otherwise. And so, uh, to go on some empirical examples, now, people can work... Not too long, to work. just take one example, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, just one. Uh, it goes with IP uh, and all this, precisely with no property, with no private intellectual property on their work. There are many people working on, you know, uh, not Windows nor Apple, but the so-called Linux, it's an operating system. And uh, on some version of it, people are really not paid to work on it and have no property on it. And though, on the Debian Linux distributions, and though it's one of the most powerful IT tool we have today. So, well, it's just a single example. We do not have that much uh, example of on that scale, but... Okay. <coughs> More questions, interventions? It's your last opportunity at this conference to say something. Yeah. Um, uh, just uh, to bounce back on the tragedy of common thing, um, it seems to me that we didn't talk about uh, uh, kind of the effects of the choice of, uh, of the type of property and the structure of property that we adopt, but I feel that it, it, it does have a strong uh, effect on the ethos that, that the society will have. Uh, and then, so maybe that's why it worked so well before, uh, maybe the ethos uh, was different, but uh, definitely was. Uh, but the effect that um, to see property as dominion as we've seen it for so long has obviously had a strong effect on the way that uh, our ethos was, was, uh, was built. Uh, so now, uh, to go back to, to Carl's you know, a nice little graphic, we just want to get there, but we're there, how do we, ch if, if we want to get to, to as close to something as, as just as possible, um, it, it, there seems to be a, 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 something that we need to switch in terms of, of how we think and how we act, the type of behaviors that we want to adopt for ourselves and for others, and so the ethos of society, and so how do we do that? Do we, do we change, do we, uh, uh, you know, reform property first. Do we reform ethos first? Does it? Is it? Uh, you know, um, is there a start, or is it? Uh, is it uh, uh, something we do together? Uh, yeah. Well, how do you see the, 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 this kind of? A, okay. Uh, switch? You. Yes. Um, it would be a question for Carl um, more specifically. How would you? How would you uh, portray? How would you imagine your ideal uh, shape of? Uh, of a, of a state institution, or uh, how big would it be? How how, how ideally uh, too big or, or small enough would it be for humans to cooperate in a in a shared environment? Uh, uh, what scope for the commons? Uh, or for, for the, the commons and also and for the public? How would you call that institution? Which I, I don't mm -hmm. know if you would call it a state or or just a self mm -hmm. self organized state okay. in a way. Any other question? Let's see. Very brief question for for Jean Fabien. Um, so, uh, private property is the precondition for pro prosperity. But what, what do you mean with this word prosperity? Do, do you mean a more equal society? I mean, a more equal society, or what does it mean? Because it certainly has been the case in the 19th and most part of the 20th century, but one can doubt it's still the case today. So, what does it mean prosperity? Okay. Any last question? No. No. Yes. Well. Um, my, my question is uh, if uh, private ownership uh, is necessary uh, to organize a society, uh, is it private ownership on things in themselves or on rights over things? Because, in fact, we can be a diverse person to have diverse, ra diverse rights on uh, the same things. Right. Uh, and it can organize the uh, relationship, the common relationship to that uh, thing. You know? yeah. So, ownership on the thing or on the right over thing. Okay, let's uh, respond. Perhaps let's start with Jean Fabien. Uh, uh, the answer I would like to make is, is uh, of course, um, 
we need property because property is, is a way to constrain people to adopt behavior they wouldn't adopt uh, otherwise. But of course, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, property owners can constrain other people to do anything they want or any kind of constraint uh, has to be legal. So the uh, question of uh, the place of property in a society is, is uh, intrinsically linked with, with uh, democ democracy, with democracy, with a democratic society which means that uh, we have to decide collectively what kind of constraint we find acceptable, we accept to, to be submitted to, and what kind of constraint uh, we do not find acceptable. And we have to have a democratic procedure in order to uh, make a distinction between the kinds of constraint we find acceptable and the kinds of constraint we do not find acceptable. I, I would like just to, to give you an example. There is in the United States a very famous lake, it's Lake Tejo, uh, a very magnificent place with very lucid and transparent water, waters. And in fact, it has very little pollution, but no one knows where it comes from, but probably from human activities. So uh, the, 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 the municipality, uh, the public authorities, took a, uh, a decree uh, forbidding any further uh, construction around the lake on a very large uh, strand of land. Of course, the owners of those strands of land uh, protest very vigorously uh, uh, their property uh, rights are violated. But this is a clear example where property rights might be limited and constrained in the name of the public good, even if uh, it's not proved that the property rights and the property owner are responsible for the pollution. But it's a, m a measure of precaution, and it's perfectly legitimate. So, uh, yes to rights of property, but yes to limited rights of property in the name of um, the possibility of anyone to have access to a decent life, and uh, limited by the necessity to preserve some common goods which are absolutely necessary. That's and the possibility for everyone to have a decent life, that's your definition of prosperity. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay, so I, I guess I'm answering these yeah. two questions. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think uh, private property rights are rights between persons with respect to things. And private, um, and ownership, I can equate that Ownership um, has many of, the, of what Hofeld calls legal incidents. There's a powers, that, which is an authority to change something, and claims, which relates to how other people act towards you, liberties, the things you may permissibly do, and immunities, the, the ways in which other people cannot change your legal status in relation to something. And the only encumbrances I think I would put on private property rights uh, are two, um, and this, this comes from the, the left libertarian thing. So I would say that uh, if I own this bottle, I can do whatever I like with it. I have all, all the powers, immunities, all the Hofeldian incidents with respect to it. Um, with, of course, the proviso that any theory of rights has, which is that as long as you don't violate other people's rights with it, but that, I just take that for granted. Um, the one thing I can't do with this, on my view, is, or the one Hofeldian incident of ownership that I lack with respect to this, is leaving it in a will to someone else after I die. Okay? The other the second uh, restri <laughs> restriction is um, on what I may do with any natural resources that I have private property in. Um, and there uh, I want to say that I have a duty, uh, well, a liability to have to pay the value of those natural resources into a fund that everybody, including myself, is entitled to an equal slice of. So, and those, and otherwise, people can do what they like with their property. Come. Well, I agree uh, with John Fabien. What kind of constraint do we find acceptable? Well, I agree to that, plus a limitation. 
that basically we can create whatever kind of property rights we want, but, but we have to keep in mind that we will never have a unanimous agreement. And so we have to limit ourselves that we create basically what we want, but ask as little from the least advantage as we possibly can because we're going to make rules that favor the, favor the people who are closer to political and economic power as much as we think we're, we're already helping those, those people, that we've already saved them from that horrible state of nature, um, that uh, as much as we think we've already done everything we need to for the, for the disadvantaged, we're going to screw it up almost certainly in that direction. So we need to give them the we need to give them as, as much as we as we can and ask as little and, and uh, offer as much. Now um, so that gives us a lot of different ways we could create private property. Um, uh, there was a famous case where Madonna was bought bought an estate in Britain and she wanted to close the walking walking pass through her property. People had rights away despite the fact she had ownership and I think the courts rightly did not let her do it. The thing was, if you don't want people walking on your property, you shouldn't have bought this property. It came with that. That's the kind of property we wanted to create and therefore it's, and you paid money for it, it's the kind of property you want. That's sort of a rule which doesn't give you uh, a hard answer to how big I envision the government being. Probably with some regulations and some infrastructure and support for the least advantage, it won't need to be terribly large, but I don't really know, and uh, I'm worried about taking up too much time. So I think I covered, I think I covered these fairly well. Okay. Do, do we think, do we agree that he covered it sufficiently well for this time of the day yeah. and at the end of the conference? Okay, so let me perhaps uh, conclude unless the organizers want to say a final word by uh, thanking very much uh, the organizers in the first place for having made uh, this possible and perhaps also our hosts here. At uh, DULB, I'm not quite sure about the organigram uh, here, and uh, I suppose we have to extend some uh, uh, thanks uh, to uh, Justine and, and uh, Jean-Luc, Jean-Yves, 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 okay, uh, to, uh, to Justine and Jean-Yves for having made this, uh, the, this possible also by hosting us in this uh, very uh, nice uh, building and very nice garden, which we enjoyed to an exceptional extent, thanks to the exceptional weather. So uh, thank you very much. I propose we upload uh, these people to all. Uh, <laughs> And then... Uh